Okay. Uh, just coming back from Hong Kong on Tuesday and on Wednesday evening, I was invited to give a, a talk with an old friend, the Professor David Blair. He's a physics professor from UWA, just on cosmic spirituality, on how the nature of this universe and the nature of this mind, especially as understood by Buddhism, how it all works together. And a couple of people have asked me, what did you talk about? And I said, well, maybe I will tell you tonight. So tonight's talk is called Big Bang Buddhism. <laughs> because this, this resonates with my own story, my own life story, because now, I studied theoretical physics at Cambridge because I really wanted to know what is going on. And with theoretical physics, it was just a study of the enormous, the nature of this vast universe and where it came from. And more importantly, how it works. You know, what is this stuff which you see in the night sky? That's the big stuff. And what is this small stuff, you know, in the center of you, these atoms and these uh, elementary particles and sub-elementary particles? What actually are they? How do they work? What makes you? And that was your first inquiry. But part of the, the massive scale of astronomy, I was part of the Astro, Astronomic Society, Astronomy Society in Cambridge, and I remember just one event which really moved me. One of those times you'll never forget was when, after with my friends, going to see that iconic movie, 2001, A Space Odyssey. For those of you of my age, you maybe remember that movie. That was really weird. But after listening to that movie, me and my mates... We went out to the observatory just outside of Cambridge because being a member of the society, I could go in any time I liked. And we sat on the end of these huge telescopes. Remember like in those ancient movies, these huge domes with these massive telescopes and you sat at the end. Yeah, these days you can get a telescope from the shop in Perth, which is probably even more magnification, but it hasn't got sort of the charisma and the excitement of these huge devices. And I was told that that particular telescope, I think they discovered Neptune on that one. It was a very famous telescope. And you got to sit in a chair and just watch the heavens and the amazing stuff out there. And that evening, Saturn was visible. So you could see the whole orb of Saturn with its rings live. Not in a picture, not in a movie, but live. And that was an amazing experience. Because whenever any of you do that, and I encourage you to do that. Now, the talk was given at the Gravity Center up in Jinjin. And they got the observatory next to it. We were invited to actually to stay behind and have a look at the stars. It's always an amazing experience. But because of the bushfires down south, it was all cloudy, so it was a waste of time. But I've done that before. Just stood in the, looked on the end of the telescope at these amazing things you see out there, and also to get an idea of the actual size of that and how we fit into it. It literally is awe-inspiring just like religion or spirituality should be. But to understand the relationship between that, there was another experience here in Perth maybe 20 years ago. There was some anniversary of something or other, and at the old observatory of Perth, which is between Parliament House and King's Park, it's not used anymore, but that's where the first observatory in this state was situated. Mm -hmm. There was... A, a series of talks, and I gave one of them. And at question time, this lady sort of put her hand up and said to something very profound. She said, whenever I look through a telescope at the universe, I feel my Catholic faith is threatened. Please answer what you think about that. And I said my answer was, Madam, if you could only look at the other end of the telescope, you know, the fat end, and look back to see who's watching, science becomes threatened. 
And that was what I was doing after looking at sort of the so-called mystery of the universe and not really being able to find any satisfactory answers. Because all the scientists, yeah, they can give these theories. How many really understand what they're talking about? As I mentioned to Professor David Blair, and he approved of this, what I learned is that a lot of times the great scientists, they never understand what they're talking about. They just get used to it. The idea of a Big Bang, the idea of an expanding universe, the idea of these great spaces between things. Yeah, you sort of don't get un- understand it. You just get used to talking about these big numbers. But to really understand it, to really get into it, that is the role of spirituality. That's where you stand back and you stop thinking about the equations or the names, but you get some idea of what that means by those huge distances, those huge spaces of emptiness, pure emptiness, which goes on and on and on just forever. And some understanding of what's happening out there. Only a a little twinkle of an understanding. And most of it is beyond you. But for me, the idea of a mysterious cosmos was not where I could stop. Because that's what happens with a mystery. If you stop at a mystery and leave it at a mystery, you're copping out of the adventure of the mind which seeks for truth and knowledge. Whenever I see a Sudoku, you have to solve it. If there's a riddle, you have to find its answer. Whenever there is a question, you just can't stop and say, oh, who cares? There's something about the human mind which has to find the answer, which has to go in and find deep what is actually going on in there. And for me, studying all of that stuff, and I remember some time, I remember one occasion, There was a lecturer, and this was actually Stephen Hawking's lecturer, Professor Sharma. I was listening to one of his lectures. It was on the astrophysics of the galaxy. An amazing title for a series of lectures. But after a while, I just stopped. I couldn't write down any more equations. Because I just had to think, wow, what's he talking about? That is incredible. You weren't actually learning the astrophysics anymore. You were just appreciating it. Like instead of learning the names of the flowers in King's Park, you're just looking at one. Wow, an amazing thing just one flower actually is. You just stay there and go into it and just explode in its meaning. That's what's really happening. That's why I call this talk Big Bang Buddhism, because it does explode into your consciousness the meaning of these things. An explosion is probably the right word. Because explosion is big insights which happen. And explosion because it does destroy some of the, the superficial, silly things which we do in our lives. I think that's one of the reasons why people like to get into this science. Because it's so vast and so wonderful that all the petty things which we worry about in life, you know, like dying, like cancers and like wars. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, someone, for laughing. (laughs) In the vastness of space and time, all these things, the global financial crisis, the euro debts, they just become, what the heck are you talking about? And that's why a lot of the time, some of these scientists, they look through there and, wow, you get a different dimension to your consciousness. But you can never really grasp it. And at the same time, it was not addressing those really important questions, which my compassion said, look, it's okay to understand where this universe came from and get all those answers, but there's people crying out there, screaming. They must have some way of connecting these two together and finding some solution. And to me, the solution was looking down the telescope in the opposite way looking at who was watching at the universe, not looking out there into the universe. That's the story. When you look through the lens of a telescope in the ordinary way, you see the great universe, you see all which is out there. And I decided to look through the telescope in the opposite way, to see who was watching, 
who was this thing observing this universe? And is this thing observing the universe something separate from this universe? Are we as observers somehow independent of what's happening out there? I know the universe is expanding, and I know so are many of you, especially me. This is the nature of the expanding universe. The universe does it. How can we stop doing the same? <laughs> so, looking through the opposite end, that's called a spirituality. To see who's watching. And to understand this looker, this observer, and to find out if that observer has any relation to this thing which it's watching. And that is where the spirituality, especially the spirituality of Buddhism, leaves science. Unfortunately, that many of you might hear people keep saying, oh, this observer, it's just a byproduct of the universe. Almost like it's created by the universe so that something can observe it, like some narcissistic universe, which only wants to exist when it's appreciated. So it creates people who can wonder at the amazing nature of this universe, like a god who creates people so they can have someone to worship him. That idea never really made any sense to me. So the universe isn't narcissistic. It doesn't need people. So is there some other understanding there? So that's when you go in to the inner space. When you say subatomic particles, that's going in into nature. But as a Buddhist, we go further in, beyond the material universe. And that is why you can see the type of meditation you've been hearing here. The type of meditation which you can read in the books, it goes beyond the material world. And you experience that when you're meditating and your body disappears. It's not just your body disappearing. The whole universe is disappearing as well. And time as well. And I like the idea of this universe being like the four-dimensional space-time continuum. But what is that time? What is that space? Yeah, you can describe its contents. You can you know, use the idea that this is always expanding. But what actually is it? To understand that, you look through the other end, the observer, and you find some amazing things. In my meditations, you go really, really deep. And one of the great insights which I have is that you create that universe and you create that time. You don't imagine just how powerful you are as a creator of things, especially the creator of time. Sometimes people, what is this? And the time is the, the product, not of some sort of uh, universal system or some laws. It's a product of this mental event called craving, wanting. When you want, you create time. It's a fascinating thing to see. The more you want, so the more time just gets important, strong, powerful, and time becomes really, really a, a prominent feature in your life. But when you stop this wanting, this craving, time, first of all, gets very flimsy, it becomes uh, almost like diaphanous, in other words, see-through. It's almost not there. When you stop wanting to get all together, time vanishes. And that becomes your experiences in meditation. This is not something beyond anybody sitting in this room. There will be times when you sit in this meditation and you really go into some still states of mind. And you come out afterwards and I ask you, where was time? Where did time go? Because it happens, it happens to me many times, it's happened to many people, uh, many people listening to me now, listening on the internet. There's times you're meditating, and you come out of meditation, you can't believe that two hours have gone past. And you haven't been asleep. You've been perfectly aware. But time has lost its meaning. It literally has disappeared. And those of you who are rushing around, who haven't got much time, why? because you're craving a lot, you're wanting a lot. It's not your fault. Don't blame yourself and get into guilt trips. That's the trouble. In Buddhism, when we say craving 
is the cause of all this suffering. And we take craving is guilt. And it's another sort of sinner, just like Eve was a, you know, the problem of Christianity, you know, original sin. And we put that on craving. Craving is original sin in Buddhism. And we get into guilt trips again. There's no guilt trips in Buddhism, okay? This is just the nature of craving. It creates time. And it creates this movement which multiplies space into this great diversity. It's one of the reasons why that modern civilization is so complicated. You know, even I remember, I was 60 years of age, life was more simple. It's nobody's fault because of so many wants interacting this mesh of desires, this web we create gets more and more complicated the longer we live. That's why going to a monastery is just so simple. So nothing much to do. And that is like a return to the beautiful simplicity. Little craving, much time, and a great sense of freedom. And the simplicity and the peace which comes from simplicity. But we create that. It's an amazing thing to realize that you know, when you understand the nature of the mind by looking through the telescope in the opposite direction and see what's, who's observing, it's not only we realize that we're the creator, but it means it gives us the possibility to be free, to create a beautiful, peaceful world in and around ourselves. Well, that was a great promise you know, of Buddhism, the promise of karma, that you can do something. You're not a victim. There is something you can do, and this is how you do it. It's a brilliant teaching, and of course, I've been practicing all my life, you know, this, and you know, most of my life in this incarnation, it works. You can create peace, you can create happiness, you can create meaning. It's this person inside. But a lot of times, people say, well, where is the objective evidence in this? One of the challenges which Professor Blair gave to me, he said, you know, how can you have these experiments which you can repeat to prove things. The scientific method is that whatever you do can be repeatable in a laboratory in the other part of the world so you can check whether the results are right. And of course the answer is you are that experiment. You are the one who can actually stop all this craving. Close your eyes, go inside and see who's watching. And experiment and find out who this thing is. And it's amazing what you can find out. I was just talking in the car on the way up here about Buddhist psychology, which is part of the nature of this mind of this observer. <laughs> but no, we actually find out a lot of amazing stuff. But what people have done, we've repackaged that, you know, so it's acceptable to science. And one of the parts of Buddhist psychology which I was talking about on the way up here was this uh, great experiment done by a Professor Libet, L for London, I B. B for Brahm, uh, E, T, and T for cup of tea. So Professor Libet was noticing that before you do something, and he was saying before you sort of flex you know, your, your, uh, your fist, he said, you can see in the brain, there's a part of the brain turns on. You can see that the brain is giving the instruction for you to flex your wrist. So it's just a, a simple you know, brain scan. You can actually time when the, the brain gives that order and when the, the, uh, the fist flexes. And that's obviously it's a, a very small time, uh, time, uh, time difference between the order coming from the brain and you flexing your wrist. That can be very accurately measured. But the interesting thing, he wanted this thing which we identify as will because you choose to flex your wrist. At least that's what it appears like. 
And this choice, which you can observe, you know when you choose. You know when you make that decision to flex your wrist. And you could very easily time that. With the right hand, you flex. With your left hand, when you decide to do that, you press the button. And it's very easy uh, for these experimenters to take into account reaction time, to find out which comes first. What you take to be your will, or the initiation of this process in the brain. And his great discovery was the brain begins first. The lights in the brain, the brain chooses first. And then that which you take to be will chooses to open the fist and then it opens. That which you take to be will is not the initiator of the process. By the time you choose, it's impossible to choose otherwise. That which you think is your free choice, by the time you're aware of it, by the time you make that choice, there's no other choice possible. The brain has fired, then will happens, then you do totally undermines what you thought you were. That's what we mean, looking through the other end of the telescope and finding out exactly what's happening in here. Now that's the sort of stuff which I really love because that challenges assumptions about life and about who you are. And that is the great contribution of modern science to our world because it challenged basic assumptions, things which you thought were so obvious but are untrue. And that's what I took away from my learning of science. You got your head around some of these things and after a while you thought, actually, what I thought was impossible was actually was possible. It was just I never understood the thing clearly enough. Now let me give you one of my famous examples. This is to bend your mind, to show you the impossible is actually true. It was a famous example of Schrodinger's cat. Very simple to explain. He said he put his cat in a box with a closed lid. In that box was a cyanide capsule if that, this is not a very good Buddhist example because I like cats, we should never do such things to cats, but nevertheless, there's a cyanide capsule in the box and it could break or not break according to a very simple quantum process. If the atom decayed, then that was amplified and the, the capsule broke and the cat got killed. If it didn't decay, then the capsule stayed there and the cat was alive. And there's a 50 50 chance of it breaking. The truth of the matter was that after that was 50%, after a certain time, 50 50 chance the cat being alive inside the box. The truth of the matter was the cat was not alive. The cat was not dead. The cat was in between. It was a cat who was in between, neither alive nor dead. We're not talking about a cat who's just about to cark it, you know, on its last legs, about to kick the bucket. No, this was a cat who was neither dead nor alive in another state. A totally impossible, but unfortunately for you, true. Get your head around that if you can. And what you understand is just the limitation of our concepts. The very fact that our mind has not, it's got very lazy and can't stretch itself to see things which we say can't be true, but they are true. And that's what meditation does to you as well. You see things which can't be true, but are true. The nature of existence, not what you expect, or is actually true. That becomes the great experiment of meditation, seeing what's really happening underneath. And what you see there is a very important truth, something which the Buddha said and which we hold, that this mind is the creator, 
It's not the world created the mind, but the mind created the world. A very simple example, which I told Professor Blair, and I love this example because it's so simple, easy to understand, but incredibly profound. You know, sometimes religions like Buddhism can be so complex. Now, please, I apologize if the so far has been really complex, but I did that because I want to bend your mind to see things which, how can that be? To actually to create a sense of, I don't understand this because of the limitations of the mind. It's true what I've just been saying. But this is much easier to understand, but the consequences change the way you look at life, change your perceptions. It's a story of, it's in my book, Opening the Door of Your Heart, the biggest thing in the world story. One of my friends from Cambridge, still keeping contact, he became a diplomat and I became a monk. And there should be a joke about that, the diplomat and the monk. <laughs> but I can't, there's a joke about the diplomat, but I daren't say it here. But <laughs> should I dare say it? Okay, I've already started. Here we go. I'm going to get letters for this. Please, it's a funny joke. It's totally misogynistic. Well, not totally, but pretty misogynistic. But here we go. I always. Uh, they say, Ajahn Brahm steps in where angels fear to tread. Here we go again. <laughs> what is the difference between a diplomat and a lady? The difference between a diplomat and a lady. And please, this is a funny joke, so don't sort of point out this is misogynistic. The difference is, if a diplomat says yes, they mean maybe. It's diplomatic speak. They say, yes, 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 yes. They mean maybe, they'll do it. If they say maybe, they mean no. If a diplomat says no, they're not a diplomat. You know, they upset people. You can't say no as a diplomat. You say, well, maybe. So if a diplomat says no, it means they're not a diplomat. If a lady says no, she means maybe. If she says maybe, she means yes. If she says yes, she's no lady. <laughs> So please don't cancel your membership of the Buddhist Society. It's only a joke. <laughs> but anyway, so that's a joke, so you don't get too serious here. And the story of the biggest thing in the world. My mate, he had kids. And when his daughter was in grade one at a school in England, now grade one, okay, the teacher asked everybody in the class, it was part of the lesson, what is the biggest thing in the world? Miss, 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 said one kid. My daddy, my daddy is the biggest thing in the world. Remember a five or six year old kid, it's really sweet. Someone else said, miss, miss, uh, an elephant is the biggest thing in the world. It's getting better. Miss, miss, a mountain is the biggest thing in the world. That's pretty good. And the daughter of my friend, she said, miss, my eye is the biggest thing in the world. And everybody stopped. What do you mean your eye is the biggest thing in the world? And she said, well, miss, my eye can see her daddy. My eye can see a mountain and an elephant and so much more. If all of that can fit into my eye, my eye must be the biggest thing in the world. <laughs> now, that, isn't that brilliant for a five, six-year-old? She's now doing postgrad research work in biochemistry in Oxford. Brilliant lady, even at five or six. See things in slightly different ways. And you see things in a different way. The consequences of that insight are enormous. So you know, he wrote and told me that. I thought I'd be interested, and I really was interested. Because usually when you hear things, don't stay there. Take it further. The old saying I said here a few years ago, you never stand in the shadow of giants, you stand on their shoulders. Someone says something smart, you take it further. Anything which I teach here, you teach it more. Don't just stop and worship the teacher. Learn more than the teacher and take this knowledge, this insight to another level. That's my challenge to each one of you. Don't stand in my shadow or anyone else's shadow. Stand on our shoulders. You take it further. So that's what I did. I took it further. And I thought, well, you're not quite right. The mind, 
the human mind, that which knows, that can see everything your eye can see. And it can imagine things you will never ever see in this world. It can hear real and imaginary sounds, it can smell, it can taste, and it can feel real and imaginary sensations. And it also has its own special area of knowledge, knowing, sadness, happiness, joy, grief, everything which can ever be felt or known can fit into your mind. So the mind is the biggest thing. I never said in the world, because you can know the world, therefore the world can fit into your mind. The mind does not fit into the world, the world fits in to your mind. That's one of the first, of, or the first saying in the Buddhist scriptures, the Dhammapada, the mind is the chief, the forerunner of all things. That's what it means. Everything you can ever know, even this whole galaxy, can fit into your mind, because you can know it. So when you're looking at the stars at night, the whole galaxy, 14,000 million light years in radius, you might say a diameter. What would you actually say? You'd probably say, well, it doesn't really work either way, but roughly about that size. 14,000 million light years. With, I think, it used to be when I was a student, with 100,000 million galaxies, each with about the same number of stars. All of that can fit into your mind because you can know it, you can embrace it. How big is your mind? It's huge. What a wonderful concept that is. Because the problem with modern physics is that we see just how tiny we are. And many people say we're just an infinitesimal speck on this planet Earth. Just one of how many billion people now? 20 billion, isn't it, or something, people? You're just one out of six billion? Seven. One out of seven billion. I stopped counting a long time ago. <laughs> one of seven billion. That's infinitesimal. And this little planet Earth... A tiny little planet running around an insignificant star just on an on a insignificant part you know, of, the, of the Milky Way, which itself is not a particular you know, high-class galaxy. We're just so not ordinary. We're much less than ordinary. Insignificant little specks who just live for 60, 70, 80, 90 years in a huge span of 14,000 million years so far. Sometimes we think we're insignificant. That's one of the problems of our modern world. With so many people so uniform, all wearing the same clothes, watching the same TVs, sometimes even speaking the same language. Sometimes that we lose the sense of being special, which is really important in life. That's why many people get depressed, and no one will miss us. But no, your mind is the biggest thing. The whole galaxy, so many... It's not even the whole galaxy. When you get into Buddhism, you really know, know the mind. You find out, just like the scientists said, this is not the first Big Bang. There's been Big Bangs before. You know we believe in reincarnation. Everything gets reincarnated, even galaxies do, or universe systems. So yeah, this universe has been going for 10,000, no, 14,000 million years. That's only this one. I can't understand why people think this is their only life. Or why they think, this is actually part of like human conceit and ignorance. Where I came from, I remember history, Europe, the centre of the world. And we always thought, if you look at history, if you send the boats too far, you fall off the edge. <laughs> we thought that was the centre of the whole world and the universe. And the sun would actually go around the planet Earth. That's what people thought. And then we realised we weren't that special in fact, you know, it's not that the universe goes around us. We go around the sun. That was a big loss of ego for humanity. And then where I lived, you know, he sent these 
boats overseas and they found China, they found India. We found actually we weren't alone, but your Chinese were just as bad. You thought yourself was the middle country and the center of the earth. Isn't it strange how we always think that we are the center of everything? Okay, now we realize this earth is round. There's so many different people. You know, one country is not the center of the whole planet earth. And you're not the center of the universe. That we go around the planet earth. But what we do think now that we are the only universe... We are the central universe, the special universe. Isn't it, doesn't it just not take a big jump of imagination to realize, just like we found out that there was other peoples in other countries, that there's other solar systems, there's other planets, there's other times. Why can't there be other universes? Why not? If there's one, isn't it, wouldn't it be really strange if there's only one, why wouldn't there be many? That's one of the greatest, one of the greatest uh, proofs of reincarnation. There is one life. If there's only just one life, that would be really weird. A singularity is called weirdness. And that's a very singular, that's part of the word, the, in, the English words being singular, being very strange. If there's one, why shouldn't there be two? Or three, or four, or more? And life has always told us that. We find one planet, we find another planet. We find one universe, we find other universes. I'm not talking about galaxies, whole universes. And this is what you find out in meditation, whole cycles of universes, whole tens of thousands of billions of big bangs. This is not the only one. So don't be so egotistically centric. Why can't there be many more? Now that gives us huge space of time. All of that can fit into your mind. Your mind is amazing. And your mind is what contains and creates the universe. Now that is really cool. It's not that this mind emanates from the brain. And there's so much evidence. We spend a lot of time talking about the evidence for rebirth or the evidence for near-death experiences when your brain actually stops. Or those people, like uh, the first uh, time I saw this was in the article... It was in Nature. Professor, uh, what's his name? Lorber, L-O-R-B-E-R, -E Sheffield University. This was in the 1980s. He was one of the first people who was doing brain scans of people with slightly deformed skulls. And he found the boy with no brain. That was a great article. The boy with no brain. They did a brain scan of him. And he was a graduate in mathematics. He was doing graduate studies. This is a really clever kid. And when they did the brain scan of him, no brain. Just 1% cortex, only 1%. No of this other stuff, hypothalamus and other stuff which is supposed to you know, be so important for you. It was all cerebral fluid. And there he was. This boy who was more intelligent than probably most of you. With no brain. So, as Ajahn Sujato um, said at this conference, like, you know, understanding the mind is a no-brainer. <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing to do with the brain, for goodness sake. There's people who haven't got any brains. Absolutely none, or nothing which is, can ever do all this stuff. There are no brains, but they've got a mind. And when you die, you know, just before you die, these near-death experiences, people actually float up. There's that one amazing case. He floated up off the, the operating theatre really high in one of these old operating theatres in, I think it was America somewhere, and he saw on the ledge, because they don't have windows at you know, eye level, otherwise people look in and know who they're cutting up today. No, they don't look in. So the windows for light are very, very high up, maybe three or four metres up. And he floated up and he saw on a ledge there was a tennis shoe on the ledge of this window. So when he came back again and he revived, he said, I had this experience floating outside my body. I saw a tennis shoe way up there. And for once, they could actually test out to see you know, whether this was just imagination or fantasy caused by you know, what people like Susan Blackmore say. Is, you know, she's a professor of Oxford. That's why I don't trust her, because I'm from Cambridge. But I shouldn't go into that. <laughs> but... <laughs> saying that all of these chemicals flood the brain and make you see strange things. If that was a fantasy, 
But it wasn't a fantasy because they got a ladder up and they checked, my goodness, there was a tennis shoe in the operating theatre of this big hospital. No one knows how a tennis shoe got on the ledge there. It's not supposed to be on the ledge there, but it's there. And she saw it and no one else knew it was there because she actually floated up and only from that height can you actually see it. It's amazing incidences like that and there are many. And at that time... The brain was not operating. Even if it was, how can you laying down, you know, see what's on a ledge which no one else can possibly see? Now there's lots of evidence. And one of the things which I was trying to teach the scientists is look, just in the same way you taught me when I was learning my physics, that this quantum physics, you have to put aside your ideas and concepts of what's logical, what's right. You have to suspend everything. If it's evidence is there, if it's compelling, you have to change the way you think to fit the truth. That's why some time ago I said there are two types of religion in this world, and that includes science. Two types of religion, science. The first, which will bend the truth to fit your beliefs. And you know what I'm talking about there? You believe in a creator God, you believe that you pray to Jesus and you'll be healed of everything. You know, you believe in even praying to the Buddha and then you win the lottery. <laughs> you bend the truth to fit your beliefs. And that's also science when it says, no, 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 the mind cannot exist outside the brain. There's no way you can have these near death experiences, no way you can have rebirth. No, it can't happen. Why? Because I believe there can't be. It doesn't matter what you believe, it's what the facts are. And this is the challenge of truth, of coming to a place like this. I'm going to challenge you, and you will be challenged. The other type of religion is when you bend your beliefs to fit the truth, to fit the facts. It doesn't matter what you believe. And that's a great, His Holiness the Dalai Lama said that, if science proves that all of my teachings of Buddhism are wrong, I will abandon Buddhism. And that's a Buddhist. You, know, you have to abandon your most cherished beliefs if the facts prove the opposite. But the point is, the facts are there. Reincarnation, the independence of the mind from the body. That's powerful. And that is where the spirituality comes from. When you look through the telescope, look at what's watching, this mind, and understand what it is. That was my experiment, that's my physics, what I've been doing for the last 38 years as a monk looking at who's watching, understanding what it is. Not only do you get this great understanding of what this universe is, but you get the payoff too. Because one of the problems with science, it doesn't address the pain, the desperation, the joys and the tears of life. And that's one of the reasons you're here. Not just to know the reason why we exist, but to know how to live. And that's one of the things you notice when you see how the mind works how it can create happiness and joy, how it can create suffering. You are not the victim anymore. You can change different perspective. You can forgive and let go of the past. It's not that hard to do. You can look at your future and create whatever you want for your future, at whatever age. When you realize how powerful this mind is, you realize how free you are, incredibly free, to create. The choice is in your hand. Laughter or pain, which do you want? It's up to you. Choose. And this is how to walk that path. That's what you find when you look at the observer. And that becomes a fascinating journey. So all, any wisdom which you hear from the monks and nuns here, it doesn't come from the books, you know that. It doesn't come from repeating what some other person says. It always comes from looking deep inside the observer, the one who's watching, understanding it, and then bringing that out to the world. So you too can live a life of smiles and happinesses and joy. For example, that some of you may know, my mother died yesterday. No grief, no sadness. 
Does grief, sadness, does that help? She's free, free of this world. She had Alzheimer's, no quality of life. What a wonderful thing. Now she's free. Well done, Mum. No grief, seeing things in a different way. No suffering, but joy. Are the culmination of a wonderful life. Well done, Mum. I dedicate this talk to you. Have a great rebirth. And that's the talk today. <laughs>